I'll say, any chance you can move over here just a tad so she has a little bit? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's fabulous. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm glad the snow kind of lets us we could have this great event today. Um, obviously, we're here to support local farmers. We're here to learn a lot, a lot of information today. Uh, my name is Neil Morissette. I'm a CNF bank. Um, again, we're a happy host. We love working with Ella Thompson uh, and real local in these kind of events. So today, we, like I said, we have real local. We have four great panelists. Um, they're going to be soaked in a few minutes. Um, but first, we're going to watch a little video. Um, yeah, I'm going to let her uh, but if you haven't been to one of these events before, we do these monthly. Um, this is the last one of the year, obviously, but we'll be starting these back up again next year. So um, if you provide your email, we'll definitely send you an email in the next event. Is. Um, they cover all range of topics from farming um, to uh, trends in Richmond to Mayor Stoney and McCandle on these events. So, um, kind of all over the place. Are you ready? Yep. All right. Thank you. Farmers all across America will wake up long before the sun rises, go outside and work. They'll grind feed, water, deliver, seed, tow a friend out of the mud, and help a mama cow there's a strength and pride that awakens within us when we think about these people, these stewards of our earth. And yet, tomorrow morning, farmers will face more than just the daily chores. The average American farmer is now 60 years old. In the next 15 years, 50% of America's agriculture equity is going to change hands. Think about that one. Can't freeze rural America and amber, you know. One out of every five bites an American takes was grown outside of the United States. It almost becomes impossible to enter farming. The generation of people is sort of waking up to the fact that, wow, it is a lot more fun to farm than having a desk job. They're interested, they want to connect with their food, they want to learn about raising animals and growing vegetables. It's just been a dream come true to wake up every morning and really enjoy what you're doing. The family put up the land for sale and I thought I was going to have a chance, then, then came the crash. You've been living on the farm the whole life. Grandpa saw that there wasn't enough money to sustain the family, so he went and got a job at General Motors. I was with a bunch of guys from New York, D.C., Baltimore. They told me about farmers markets. We have to bake it now and I know that they spray the hell out of potato. A lot of our customers are young families with small children. You know, they're just bringing them into the world and they want to raise them healthy and raise them right. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. One of the things that we, we said we wanted to do was to make some American flag. America stands at a moment of truth. Who will own our farmland? I know that I'm going to be doing this for the next 35, 40 years <coughs> to be able to purchase a piece of land here in Weston. Who will grow our food? Social media is the easiest, most successful way for people to get to know their farmers. End of the day, a cool hashtag here too. Where will this next generation of farmers come from? I believe in the future of agriculture, with a faith born not of words, but of deeds. The number one thing I think a young farmer needs, it's a chance, an opportunity to take what we have and offer it to the world. Thanks to CNF Bank for hosting us. They've been such a great partner. 
um, in this journey that we've been on, and so we really appreciate you guys, appreciate you guys using us this morning. Um, so, was anyone surprised to know the average age of the American farmer? That surprise anyone that it was 60 years old? Um, let's. I just wanted to do a quick survey. So, how many of you, how many of your great grandparents own farmland or live on a farm? Raise your hand. Okay, keep your hands up. So, how many of your grandparents own farmland? Yeah, I mean, so the numbers kind of go down, which is really, really interesting. Um, we've, we've sort of moved into cities, we've stopped farming, um, and so we're here today to learn a little bit from these folks about the programs in Richmond that are offered um, to help farmers, you know, enter back into the workforce. Um, and as Joel Salton said in the clip, half of America's farmland is going to change hands in the next 12 years. Half. That's pretty incredible. It's a staggering statistic. Um, so we're here today because we believe in strong local food systems are the backbone of strong local economies. We believe growing food sustainably is an important profession that younger generations should be encouraged to enter. So we hope that you guys will be here today with a better idea of what's happening here in Richmond to try and improve uh, the statistic. So um, Real Local RBA is a small grassroots membership-based organization here in Richmond. Um, and we work to connect uh, small local businesses to small local farmers in the hopes that, you know, we're building a strong, stronger uh, local economy here in Richmond. And we do this a couple different ways. We hold monthly membership meetings um, that encourage network, net, networking between the community and also between our members. And um, then we also have an outward-facing sort of buy local uh, marketing that we encourage. So we want to teach the consumer why it's so important to purchase local food. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Um, I'll stop kind of giving our spiel and uh, bring our panel stuff so we can get going here. Today. So please let us know. <coughs> Here with a little bit of information that you feel like you can 
share with the community or do you hear folks that are interested in getting into whether it's you know small scale urban ag, they just want to garden in their own backyard, whatever that is, um, is great steps towards improving what we have going on. So thank you guys so much. Um, so I was hoping to start a little bit big picture and ask a question about what you all see as sort of the state as agriculture in Virginia right now. Um, feel free to you know, give a little bit bigger picture if you want to go into the United States and whole US. Um, but I thought it would be really great if we focused a little bit on the state of urban agriculture in Virginia and just a few thoughts on, on how you see that now and maybe where you see that going in the next five, ten years. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> it is, it's going to be a challenge. mindsets the commercial food production farming. The movement that we're all part of, I think, which is the kind of organic, uh, smaller farm production. I don't usually try to define it as urban and rural. We tend to, you know, we've got a lot of room at the Goochland campus, so it's still small farming. So when you think about small farming, I think that's what's going to end up being the driving force for this. Is somebody like Beth pulling groups together all of us keeping in touch because there's there's a limited number of people uh, interested in this. We've got to got to kind of share resources, uh, be able to to talk about each other's programs because there's always going to be that interest, that other interest of people as they come through the program. And we have a career study certificate in sustainable agriculture, so we're focusing on that. Betsy Trice teaches most of those classes for us, and uh, she lives the life. So it's always important to get somebody that really knows that part of agriculture and horticulture to, to be the lead in that. Um, but I think production-wise, it's just going to have to be a lot of smaller farms uh, coming together as, as, to make themselves a larger group. Um, there's just no way to, that we can compete for or sustainable or organic farming can compete for commercial production when it comes to quantity, but the quality can be there. The, the, and, you know, even if there's studies that say there's no nutritional difference. There's a difference in my mind, and I think all of our minds, about how these, these consumables uh, affect us in the long run. So, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. Do you have any comments that you would like to add? Um, Traditionally locked out 
Um, I know a lot of our conversation is about small farmers, period, but my focus is on you know communities of color that have been locked out even more so than you know the small farmer in general. Just thinking about all the land that African Americans have lost over the last uh, 60 years, it's uh, staggering in comparison to just a small farmer in general. Yeah. Well, Michael, you're at BSU now. How do you follow it? I think you kind of quantify the question uh, in terms of what agriculture you're talking about. Are you talking about grain agriculture, row crops, or are you talking about vegetable agriculture? Uh, because those are two different. I'm sure none of y'all have ever taken a bite out of soybeans or raw corn out that field of 1,000 to 2,000 acres. That's not the agriculture I think we're referring to, uh, but more so vegetable agriculture. And there are, there's a conundrum in investment from the state level. Uh, that really ties up a lot of things, and from the national level in terms of the farm bill. A lot of farmers and farm institutions are waiting on that farm bill to be passed to really free up funds, which says a lot about the state of agriculture. <laughs> is that it's, it's a welfare-based system that we are now waiting for <clears throat> some type of investment from some type of fund to get going. Um, and I, I travel the state quite extensively, uh, working with farmers. The biggest challenge for most farmers is market. How do you meet market? You know, when I'm looking at my friend from source partners, and that's your solution is working with those bigger distributors if you're trying to get market. Because the reality becomes, if you're doing a backyard garden, that's cool. If you're doing urban garden, that's cool. But if you're doing this as an occupation, the quantity has to be high enough to provide an income for you and your family, to feed you and your family, to provide insurance for you and your family. Which means that the mindset in terms of when you go into the, the farming enterprise has to be more of a business than a hobby. And when you have that mindset, sometimes your values can change in terms of what you believe in terms of what you put in the soil, uh, producing for quality, quantity versus quanti uh, quality. Uh, those are all things that farmers have to face on a regular basis. Farmers are the only people on the planet who have to buy retail and sell wholesale. That's a serious reality, you know, and it, it, it's a conundrum because the real question that, that we have to ask is how much are we willing to pay for our food in the future? Are you willing to change the paradigm of accepting $4 or $5 salary as opposed to $2 salary? If you can do that, it's a great future. <laughs> but if you can't see that, then, I mean, farmers going to be in, in flux. I mean, but I think that some of the saving grace and it's probably the same race to any questions you have in terms of agriculture. It's hemp and marijuana. It's, uh, it's a plant that keeps on giving. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you know, as the legislation you know looks to be loosened up after the farm bill is passed, you're going to see, I think, a boom in Virginia agriculture and agriculture throughout the state um, and throughout the country uh, as that becomes a lot more legalized. And that's maybe can reduce, can free up more general income to spend more on food, which may entail provide a better future for Virginia farmers. Well, Jeff, how with your fellows with so much influx in agriculture in Virginia right now, how do you guys sort of keep a positive environment? How are you encouraging you know, young people to the, yeah, so I think, um, <laughs> I think there's a certain amount of um, romantic ideal that people come to the world with, um, and then it bumps up against reality, and it's, I think, our task to help um, people digest that as they go through the process of learning to farm, um, specifically with my program in the, in the urban context or the peri-urban context. Um, I think part of that comes in having communication, like Jerron was talking about, about all of the things that the people who are doing the work of farming are running into, um, to open up our eyes to what we may not have seen before um, in terms of equity and access to land. Um, and then also, I think, in terms of what we eat, um, I think that's one of the challenges is to, for us, who, because I am not a farmer, I love them and I'm so dearly grateful for them, um, but my challenge as a consumer is to learn to eat differently 
too. Um, and I think that's part of what we're going to need to do in Virginia because of climate change, um, to not rely upon the things that um, we have come to rely upon because of our conventional and industrial agriculture system and learn to plant blueberries outside of our door instead of the Nandina that you can buy at the local store. Um, so it, it's going to cause a shift in um, how we all behave, um, which I think is a positive thing, like David mentioned, for our health um, and also for the health of our economy. Um, so, I mean, kind of on the heels of that, and it goes to the question of the answer to you guys. <coughs> If you guys could share, you know, and, and maybe we already answered this, but maybe you have more to add. What do you think is one thing um, our communities need to do to help more of our farmers succeed? Maybe not one thing, a couple things. <laughs> I, I, I think Beth hit the nail on the head. I'm a vegan, so I have a special interest in the food that I eat. I'm not saying you all don't, but I'm not <laughs> vegan, so but, you know. My selection is limited to vegetables. You know, the great majority of the food, the great majority of the crops that are grown are for food for animals. You know, which you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a kind of split here. You have to buy those things, biofuels. You know, and, and those things are realities. Not that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, just kind of on the heels of what we were talking about, what do we think are one or two things that our communities as a whole to help so, more farmers succeed? And that's, that's a change in diets and perspectives, uh, and really speaking with your, your wallet, making commitment to buy more expensive food. I mean, in living in other countries, our food is relatively cheap compared to other countries. And, you know, <clears throat> the quality is not always good, as it is in other countries. The, Localness is now a lot of those, a lot of the quote unquote third world countries. They grow their food in their communities, and it's right there. And it's a greater percentage of their income than ours is. So, if we change our mind about what we eat, how we eat, the farmers can start changing their mind about who they are and the role they play in this chain or the system. Uh, because many farmers, I think, have a many people rather have a low view of farming. Maybe not people in this room, but most people you see, I mean, they overhaul, the overhauls, the bib, and, you know, the straw, and about, you got this very thin type look uh, and feel about farming. And we don't put, again, because it's so inexpensive, you don't really put a value on what you eat. So when you change your mindset in terms of, because if you have, you know, one of these, with a long bench or a long oven and some of these other restaurants around here, the value the chefs put in that food makes you spend $120 for that meal because of what they put into it. It's perceptional what they put into it. Right? <laughs> I keep the same meal at home for my wife does. <laughs> $13. And that's all us all again. You know but you know, how we perceive this, our food and our farmers and the people that grow it in the system as a whole is to help to change I think it. that's a really, really important point. I mean, we just recently had um, Joel Salton, who was featured in this video, come speak in Richmond. And he's such a huge proponent of changing the perspective of how we look at farmers. He says, when's the last time that you, you know, thought of someone that got a 1600 on their SAT and you said, oh, you should be a farmer? You know, I mean, it's a really interesting thing to think about changing our perception of how we think of farming. Um, I mean, there's so much to think about when you think of farming. I mean, when you think of all that goes into the soil and the science and the... It's, a hard, it's hard to change the mindset. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it should be a very valued career. You know? and, and the local aspect to it, it's got to keep building because the amount of uh, it's the carbon footprint, if you will, of buying something that came from California in your local grocery store. It is not the way it should be. Um, we shouldn't. And, and I think our products is going to be a part of this in the long run, too. Um, I think there's got, there, there are some models now where people in really looking at it as a, as a business, a profitable business, to produce things out of season uh, in 
two and a half acre or so greenhouses that that becomes profitable. I mean, and profit is the bottom line for all of this. Everybody has to make a living at it. And if you're growing food and just barely making it on that, how do you build a career off of that? that? That is part of the whole process. And it's hard to pay more for food, maybe part of what drives that. Um, I was going to say that um, one of the things that communities can do to help farmers succeed is um, when we define community, we include corporate into that conversation. Um, because corporate is a part of our community, for good or bad. Um, and when we start connecting, um, you know, anchor institutions to our farms, uh, when I say anchor institutions, I'm talking about like, you know, the Capital Ones, the Gen Works, the, you know, the uh, Altrias, the Monsecours, the VCUs, the what, uh, Johnson Witnesses, <coughs> like all these institutions that aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, that are purchased in large amounts of uh, food for their cafeterias and or their employees or constituents that they work with. Um, when we think about the farmers trying to meet market and having dedicated supply chains, uh, what we haven't seen is that these institutions, these corporate institutions, haven't made commitments to our local farmers on a very intentional level. Um, and whether that's you know through collaboration with third-party aggregators or direct from farmers, I mean that's up to be you know clarified and debated. But yet still, there isn't there hasn't been a, a, a dedicated conversation from these corporate interests to say we're going to purchase X amount of our produce locally and X amount of our produce is coming from within a 50-mile radius. Um, and as a result, we're going to develop these supply chains and build the infrastructure to support those supply chains. Um, I think if we could do that, you know, we could really change reality for farmers on an urban and peri-urban level. You know, I think about people like, um, I don't know, Brav Bravo Farms, or, um, you know, think about folks like, uh, I don't know, uh, even try some, right, I'll use them as an example that you got. Folks um, in the fellowship on stuff um, throughout the year. If there was a dedicated purchase coming from a boss of course, say they say, uh, Ross uh, tries to control on two acres worth of produce every year, right? And they say, oh, for that two acres, we're dedicated to purchasing 1.75 acres worth of the produce that you grow, right? Well, whatever you grow, we probably buy it, right? If that was in the contract somewhere specified explicitly that they were going to do that, then I'm sure Tricycle could move with a lot more girth, you know, and assurity in terms of their, you know, production, right? And then they can also hire people instead of like relying on a volunteer workforce and other support there. So, uh, I think sometimes that sounds good in theory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the reality becomes is. Those institutions buy from distributors. Those distributors have to ensure that that food is safe. Right, in terms, you know, so gap certification has to be, you know, and that's where a lot of local farmers kind of fall flat. Fall flat. And you know, how many of us had romaine lettuce during Thanksgiving? <laughs> exactly. Right. You know, that one skip, they shut down. You know, I could have bought, you know, a. They are 15 Thanksgiving, which <laughs> done, killed a lot more people than romaine lettuce. <coughs> but <laughs> nobody had romaine lettuce the whole um, year. It's been a long time. I mean, clear the shelf because of the food safety issue. And that's the issue that comes up. You know, if you, I think no one is opposed to buying local produce that's GAP certified. Right. So they, they want it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bud wants it. <laughs> Badly. Um, so, you know, possibly those corporations sponsoring or providing, providing funds for gap certification would be an opportunity for them to exist. But as far as buying direct from farmers, it just won't happen. Yeah. I know you guys work a lot with bonds and cores in your funding portion. Has right. there been any discussion of purchasing? Do they purchase you from all? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, but I think it's always good to continue to ask the questions. And I think that um, one of the best things we can do is to keep putting it out there like that. Um, and in terms of our community, the corporate and, and those of us here and outside of the room, um, asking the questions and then listening to what the answers are and making sure that the people 
you're asking are representative of all farmers that are out there. Um, sometimes it seems really daunting to figure out all of those, um, how to make it all work, right? Or it's like, that should work, but it doesn't work because of these things. So the people who are having the issues are the ones that need to surface the, the answers. Um, and those of, of the folks that are in a position to do something need to be listened to. Um, and just at time, it's brief on the point. Uh, we have to incorporate parties you necessarily wouldn't incorporate into this conversation. Um, I'm gonna bring up a very. There's a book out. I'm not sure if you ever heard. It's called the Bible. <laughs> you, <ever heard> <laughs> you know, the first the first guy I think was a gardener or something. Right? He was in the garden. He, he you know, maybe. maybe I mean that's what that's what I read. Apple in the bowl. Things going on there about agriculture. About yeah. So you know, the start and. It, I, I don't go to church often, but <laughs> go up to church. Usually after events, they do have food. They're more willing to buy from local farmers, or should be more willing to buy from local farmers across the board than some of the large institutions. Um, and they can also help tell and reshape the story and the image of the farmer. <clears throat> All the great biblical patriarchs were farmers. They strived and succeeded through agriculture. And that's the kind of story that we need to tell continually, that these people have always shaped humanity, from Adam to Abraham to Jacob. To, I mean, the story goes on and on and on about the great agricultural feats, yet every Sunday I don't hear about that. I don't hear about it from that church. But if I was in church, I would hear about it.
think it's something that we'll definitely see in the very near future um, because there are people, when I say near, I mean like five years, 50. <laughs> um, there are people having that conversation. So if you have a rooftop, <laughs> speak up. <laughs> sure. But how about your fellow? That's who I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 So Do you want to tell that story? So we'll know about the REI. Oh, so rooftop. Okay, so that's actually interesting. Um, part of the <laughs> The thing that's really cool about farming is that there are always something new and to make your head think in an upside down way. Um, one of those upside down ways is, um, it depends on, are you talking about a dwelling, um, a rooftop like this, or are we talking about a rooftop of a container? Um, and that's what Beth is referring to. We have a fellow who um, started an employee supported agriculture program at RAI in Alexandria, where she's farming along with the employees of that store, um, gardening, it might be more like, um, on top of the storage containers that are in um, they looked at going on the rooftop, but it wasn't owned by the company, and um, there are a lot of logistical um, structural things that have to be set in place before that happens. Um, but it's the rooftop of a shipping container. Um, it's something I think about when I come back up from BSU. On the right-hand side of I-95, there's like fields of shipping containers out there, right? Can you imagine what it would be like if they all had little gardens on top? Right? I don't know who owns that, but maybe we should check that out. <laughs> Well, kind of to follow up to that, I would love for you guys each to share maybe one of your favorite success stories. You're all teaching, right? You're all hopefully teaching and growing farmers. Can you share a success or maybe even failure, if that feels more important? Um, maybe one of your students or graduates is doing okay. right now. Um, let me see. So, you know, we've done three iterations of working in a herbal garden program thus far. Um, I mean, it's a lot of, it, it depends on what you define as success. Uh, what I define as success is somebody say to a who taught and then applied it or, you know, integrated it into their thought way. So, um, Ron McGott is the uh, manager of culture and uh, I think equity at RBS. He's one of our graduates of our program. And so he took our curriculum and what he experienced during that is, and started to integrate uh, garden spaces or restored, what he's calling restorative urban garden spaces in RPS schools um, to use those garden spaces as um, alternatives for suspension and detention and out of school time, right? So instead of people getting kicked home, sent home for behavior issues, you know, they would be uh, uh, brought to the garden spaces for uh, mindfulness and um, you know uh, kind of like a healing space uh, which I think is very important because you know we talking about agriculture as you know food production with the economic development components but I think when we only talk about the economic development components we miss the mark on how holistic uh, uh, agriculture is right um, and his work, um, for me, really is, 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 is amazing because that's a systemic shift, right? You know, how much of a disparity we experience with black kids getting kicked out of school, especially African-American males, um, connecting them to green space uh, to ground them is, I think, really revolutionary and something that we need to be applauded. That's amazing. That's very <laughs> As a group, I think the sustainable ag students have a, a little different mindset than most college students, and it works to their advantage, really, because they can think us out of the box. I've got one guy who I call the, the gorilla garden, who would plant something anywhere, and he could find some space. <laughs> um, some of our students, and who may, may or not have graduated, um, the Backyard Farmer is a group that has been doing a lot of things with schools and other places. I've, I've, we've connected a few times um, over the years, but I think he's still in it doing it and um, I think there was one of the guys that used to work uh, take classes with us who was doing a, uh, a mobile bus farm basically there were things planted in the bus itself and they would take it to where it needed to go to, uh, to move the product or to demonstrate to students how to do that. so there's it's rather encouraging that people are willing to take the, these ideas and some work some don't or it's a, it's a very fulfilling part of the industry It's really hard to narrow it down just to one, um, but I, I think about people who have gone through our program and made 
a significant shift in the work that they are doing. And um, last year we have two folks that started their own farm. Um, we have Hazel Witch Farm and Creighton Farm um, that were started as a result of having gone through the program and, and begun to learn. And then we have another fellow who is um, who started a brand new business um, called Real Roots Food Systems, um, installing gardens in people's homes and on their balconies and other places in the city of Philly. So, um, so, so folks, I think, like Deron said, they're all using it in some capacity, in some way, and I think that's a huge success. I think some people learn, wow, I don't know that I want to do this exactly. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But we have confidence that they're going to take that information and it's going to cause a shift somewhere um, for the community, for themselves personally. Um, but I think those folks that started their new business and their new farm, um, we can really highlight and support um, to go buy the slightly more expensive produce because we know who's grown it and that it's grown well and that we need to profit.
have had their land taken from them, you know, especially African American farmers. So, you know, right now, it's, it's, it's yeah, I, I, I don't really, I, I think the question that I really wrestle with is like, you know, what is, an, what is, what is, what is an acceptable excuse for us not to be focusing on equity? You know, that's, that's the challenge that haunts me and I didn't really think about, <laughs> you know, like at 12 o'clock in the morning. It's like, what is an acceptable excuse for us not to be focused on racial equity, given everything that Richmond has done, the history of the city for indigenous people, people of color, like why not racial equity? That's, that's the question. Yeah. Well, you're, you're our advocate. You're an amazing advocate for that. Yeah. 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 I'm a little curious about what's going on in the state. Now, I know a lot of folks down there in, in the Randolph Farm. I spend a good bit of time there and, and I know the program. But what, what's your role there? I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> Can you find that? I do several things there. Uh, my main job, my business card says I'm the Small Farm Resource Center Coordinator. Uh, we're, man we're a content manager, so we're building a website to provide information for small farmers throughout the state. With information that comes down from various entities, with the USDA or VDAX or uh, Farm Bureau or any other people, a lot of times farmers get it two weeks after the deadline. Right. I didn't know. You know, and so we want to kind of streamline that and give them an opportunity to have all the information <coughs> or email to them according to their interests. Uh, so that's one aspect. And then I uh, work with uh, food safety, the produce food safety team for Gen Tech, uh, work with farmers to be gap certified. Uh, in doing my research for the website, I did a lot of, you know, a lot of farmers again said, you can grow anything, but we can't sell it. So I sat down with VDAX, they said, okay, well, are they GAP certified? Nope. What's GAP certified? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. So, uh, so we, we, we initiated some less. I went to California, got training, GAP certification, and kind of, you know, get myself familiar with the process. And this coming February, March, you should have five to six farmers be GAP certified. Uh, and that open up the market for them once that happens? That opens up the market for them. Understanding what GAP certification is, it's good agricultural practices, and it's a third party certification uh, that assures, or at least has some type of level of accountability in terms of food safety. Uh, so their practices itemized as a 100, 200 page farm manual that you have to have and complete and have, have it audited every year. Um, and this assures. Food Lion or Edwin Thompson or whoever else that you go to, that okay, there's an issue with the lettuce, we can trace it back to your farm and identify the problem. And also, we can identify that you're doing the right things, so if you use the bathroom, you're washing your hands. You know, the right things on your farm to make sure that food safety is not an issue or it's controlled as much as possible. Um, so, gap certification is a critical aspect in terms of opening up, scaling up, you know. Is that a standard price? Is it like scale they're, they're, for the cost? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bud told the price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, at the same time, price <laughs> price is nice. But you know, if you can sell all your produce, oh, no, no, I mean for the gap certification, is that a, you know, across the board price? Where's the price? What it cost to be certified? It's one hundred eight dollars an hour. It depends. To be certified, and the minimum we use is average about five to six hours, uh, and sometimes more depending on the size of the farm. Uh, and there's also the expenses of the auditor coming out to see. So if you get a third party auditor come, coming from California, you're paying for the airline ticket, it's gas, it's rental car, and then coming to your farm. Yeah. VDAX has two certified, two auditors. Um, USDA is trying to produce more auditors. Uh, in this area, or Virginia. Uh, so the opportunities are there. It opens up the market tremendously. You cannot get to a major grocery store or chain or a, a major restaurant or a university or anything without gas certification. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Anything you'd like to know about their programs or? I 
don't have enough questions for all this. <laughs> yeah, Dustin, I was hoping you would have a question. <laughs> you have too many to ask. Uh, actually, I just had a question on definition, though. Um, yeah. There's something about um, when we're referencing small farms, what's kind of like a vague ballpark estimate, maybe by acreage or something? Well, about USD classifies small farmers yeah. as any farm that produces uh, Revenue on farm of less than two hundred thousand dollars. Aquaman. So, uh, so most farmers under two hundred thousand. Yeah. Yes. But there's such a small percentage of. Yeah. Under, in Virginia alone, there's about approximately forty-four thousand farms. Of that forty-four thousand, forty-two thousand five hundred are small farms. Right. So that gives you an idea of scope. But those larger farms, which are mostly row crops, do most of the. Uh, you know, GDP of the agriculture in the state. Uh, but that's how they define small All right, audience question. Oh, yeah. In what ways are you seeing small farms coordinate with each other, or talk to each other, or work with each other if all of their success stories can share? I was going to say that. Uh, I see farmers. Uh, there's some farmers that collaborate, you know, as far as a cooperative. Uh, they might come together to uh, share resources in terms of marketing, uh, share resources in terms of, uh, you know, just uh, volume of, of uh, uh, production. Um, they uh, collaborate in terms of sharing, you know, equipment. Um, and I mean, it's like a, for, for, for farmers in a very small geographic area, um, it's a lot more feasible for them to share like, tractors and uh, uh, other types of highly expensive uh, tools. Um, or they might even collaborate and say, okay, we're going to put all our funds together and we're going to do some sort of a processing storage facility together. Um, and those are all like best practices for collaboration. Um, I know some farmers that are doing that, like out in Brazil County, um, uh, in Gordonville area. Of the market. Um, there are some urban farms in other areas that are doing the same, especially around two shares, um, and especially around volume. You know, instead of everyone trying to produce red romaine lettuce, you know, I'll produce red romaine, I'll do the lessee and kale, you know, I'll do you know, the okra, you know, so everyone kind of like has their specific special, special crop and then they, you know, so, so everybody's not cutting in, everybody's pro trying to get it to market with the same thing. Um, and I think that's, you know, for, for at least from my perspective, in an urban setting, it's so important for folks to do that because, you know, everybody, you know, we see it in that was haunted. I mean, um, when I used to work with Renew, Richmond, like, um, in the beginning of the season, we'll, you know, talk to our say, you know, we need red Russian kale. So we go about the business plan a ton of red Russian kale and we go harvest and bring the elbows to like, ah, somebody else got raw red Russian right kale. So we, we stuck with all this red Russian right kale. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, it's kind of devastating for, you know, small farmer to be like, oh, I think I got a dedicated line. And then, you know, that's chopped up on, from underneath you. So, um, I mean, the collaboration piece, just, it's just healthy for the food system, period. But, you know, capitalism. It's healthy. This is my experience with farmers in Virginia, all 42,500 of them. Uh, I think cooperatives are against most of their religions when they like allergic reactions to it. You just don't see collaboration in terms of working together to bring all their produce to market. You see a lot more of it in North Carolina, you see a lot more of it in Maryland, but in Virginia, it's not as Coming well, I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you know, Virginia State has worked with several groups to try to put together cooperatives. Um, so we put together, helped to assist, put together one in South Side Virginia, uh, and we're working on one in kind of Sus or Surrey County and probably you know, Fredericksburg area. Uh, but the cooperation, you see a lot of cooperation in terms of extension knowledge, sharing knowledge and wisdom, but sharing dollars. Difficult of sharing even you know, best practice, sharing markets, because many of them, unfortunately, they compete 
at the market. You go, all y'all go to the same farmer's market. Competing with one another. And <laughs> we don't necessarily, you know, we're not all bringing on the bacon or bringing on the broccoli. Or well, maybe we are bringing on the bacon and the broccoli, which is an issue for a farmer who wants to sell the bacon and the broccoli. Uh, so, you know, again, I think it's part of showing better examples. Uh, we've taken tours in North Carolina to go see cooperatives with Virginia farmers to give them an idea of what can happen if you cooperate. Um, but that's, you know, Virginia is older than North Carolina by a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Virginia has a little more history in terms of being able to work together, I think, you know, just because of, I don't know what the issue is per se, but there has been an issue, but there's a, a greater issue or a greater effort to try to work with farmers to help them work together. I think well, that's um, something that I've learned um, in the last couple of years is um, there's a place at the table in the farming community for people who are not farming because farmers don't have time. Sometimes the answer is, is I don't have time to do that. And so there's a role for folks um, who have those skills and the desire to support that community but don't have the skills or the desire to be out farming. Um, to coordinate those things. Um, one of our fellows, we just had final project presentations yesterday, and he presented the, um, his project was to create a cooperative. And he's like, now I just gotta figure out how do I make it actually happen in reality? Because um, he's got it all spelled out on paper. Um, but he's looking ahead and saying, I want to farm, but I know it's not gonna happen for me because of several things until like 10 years from now. But between now and then, this is where I want to be and what I want to be doing. And so I think there's that a really unique opportunity. Um, the business side of farming is another one where folks who maybe aren't out with that um, skill in agriculture and wanting to do that practice, but to support farmers um, who don't want to be sitting behind a computer crunching the numbers. Um, so it, it's really going to take um, an effort on all of our parts um, to, to support those farmers and make that happen with those good ideas that there's really a need to support. I, I totally concur with that. Statement and it's not because for most small farmers, and you look at it from a perspective, you work for a bank, right? You have a janitor, you have you know lenders and bank tellers and managers. Farmers are the labor, the field labor, they're the managers, they're the tractor driver, they're the structural engineer, they're the air mechanical engineer, the aerodynamic engineer, they're the wife engineer or the husband engineer. <laughs> Who's safe to go and help me? I mean, things that are signed and <laughs> document. They're the accountant. They're also the banker. The candidate. The spokesperson. The spokesperson. The job is in So it's really excellent area in which, if we look at really support small farmers, have a cooperative of those specific areas to help farmers out. So they don't have to do the after working for working a full-time job, coming home and working another four or five, six hours on your farm, then having to do paperwork after that, and then finding time to sleep, you know, and then have to do that cycle over and over and over and over. I know so many farmers, I work at night, so I'm a farm during the day. When do you sleep? When do you raise the children? When do you, I mean, there's so many, they need that type of assistance from people who can support agriculture. You don't necessarily have to be a farmer to support agriculture. Mm -hmm. You can be a marketer, you can be a social media guy, accountant. That's where they really, really need a cooperative individuals who are working on their side of the behalf. Wait. Oh, go ahead. I was just wondering when we talk about farm like working together, do you ever see any instances of, I guess, them pulling not only their resources together, but their actual product and create some sort of hub or a shared market? We had a um, beginner and farmer market happen outside of town by one of our fellows. So I don't know if you've seen mm -hmm. that also. Yeah. Well, yes. well, uh, and just to wrap up, I know we're kind of going over a few minutes, but one thing I was going to say is I think as these programs in Richmond grow and develop more and more alumni that have hopefully sort of networked through their programs, I mean, I hope some of these more collaborative efforts will you know, evolve as they grow. I mean, I know you guys are working hard about on your alumni. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I can't thank you all enough for coming to hear this today. We look to you as stewards of information. So please share what you heard today. Um, it's really, really important for us to have some sort of, you know, information disseminated out in the community that we can't always share. So um, thank you.
again to Sienna Fink for talking to the audience today. Um, thank you to Elwoods for hosting this morning. Um, there's lots of local food here in Elwoods <coughs> if you'd like to do some shopping before you leave. Um, so please, and um, stay, uh, stay in contact with 